All right, so we're continuing with our uh, special topic on linear elasticity. And uh, well, the idea is simple. Uh, so the focus is on first the formulation of uh, the stress in terms of the strain, namely the material model. But we discussed the framework within which that is going to happen, and that's a small deformation framework. And in that framework, uh, we have only a single measure of strain, which is defined through the displacement gradient tensor del u over del x, which x is this for the purposes of the gradient really doesn't matter. It's referential or spatial one. If you like, take it to be the referential one for uh, let me say, uh, um, simplicity. Um, and uh, epsilon then becomes the symmetric part of the displacement gradient tensor. Uh, so there is only one measure of strain in the small deformation framework. Uh, and likewise, there is only one measure of stress which uh, inherits the symmetry property of, let's say, the Cauchy stress tensor. And then in terms of these, well, in fact, there is also only one density because uh, rho naught, I'm going to write directly equal here. <coughs> rho naught is equal to rho. Um, and so uh, the mass balance, let's say, for solid mechanics purposes, uh, we don't really have to worry about that. Angular momentum balance is satisfied. The only thing you have to worry about is linear momentum balance, which is uh, typically stated in terms of seemingly spatial quantities, but really there is little difference between spatial or referential ones. So that will be our linear momentum balance, and we're short of six equations, and hence we need a relation between stress and strain. And that is provided through a material model, and usually what goes in there is the whole history of epsilon and not only the instantaneous value of epsilon, um, and that would be the case in material behavior such as elasticity, plasticity, et cetera. I'm sorry, viscoelasticity or plasticity. So typically, whenever you have some inelastic material behavior, what goes in here theoretically or conceptually uh, is the whole history of the strain at a material point. Um, so, but in the case of elasticity, one argues that uh, the stress depends on strain in a reversible manner and it depends only on the instantaneous value of the strain. And hence, in that special case, we want to relate a second order stress to a second order stress in the most general form possible. This expression is already linear in epsilon. There is obviously no additional constant because when strain is zero, we would like the stress to be zero. So I can only put a constant there and the most general constant I can put there is a fourth order tensor. And that's what we have done and that's where, where we, have, uh, we have left off. Uh, so now, the question obviously is, what is this fourth order tensor, and what are its properties, and how does it reflect um, the behavior of different materials? So one can imagine, of course, that different materials will have different constants in there. So how does the structure of C depend on the material that we're dealing with? So now that is, um, that, that, is that, that question immediately opens up door to a whole class, uh, let me say, of uh, discussions on so-called material symmetry. Okay. And um, following earlier remarks on the extent of depth I go into in such application topics, and even in the first part of the course on the fundamentals, um, so this is something that deserves a lengthy discussion on its own, similar to, let's say, observer transformation. A rigorous discussion on material symmetry is really, uh, uh, really something that is useful in terms of understanding um, also the implications of material symmetry. Uh, but we're going to do it in a very, let me say, concise manner. And partially, my goal here is to make a link, as I've done before, of where we are to what we have seen before in undergraduate mechanics. So where we are presently is that we have a second order stress in terms of components linked to a, another second order stress in component notation through a fourth order tensor. And that, therefore, obviously has four indices now. And um, so now there are here. In general, right, I runs from 1 to 3, J runs from 1 to 3, etc. So there are 
seemingly nine components. And here as well, there are nine components. And here, obviously, there are three by three by three. In other words, 81 components. But the question is, are all of those components independent? And the answer is obviously no. We know, for instance, that the stress is symmetric. So there are here only six independent components. And the same thing goes for strain. There are only also here six independent components. Okay. From which it immediately follows that, it immediately follows that um, what goes in between, because it's relating six independent components to six independent components, can have actually at most 36 independent components and not anymore, right? It does have 81, but it means some of those components or many of them are actually related to one another, okay? Another way uh, to see that is, of course, and we're, I'm going to make that argument once again, is that, right, so there's symmetry with respect to, uh, so, he, so here there seem to be nine and there seem to be nine. Nine is linked to another nine, right? Uh, so, but when I switch K and L, the result shouldn't change, which also means sort of that when I switch these KLN, the result should, shouldn't change. And likewise, when I switch that one, the result shouldn't change. So among these nine, okay, I'm, I'm just, just for, for the purpose of discussion, there's actually six and six there, so six, six would give you 36. Now, that, however, also is not complete because it turns out there are 36 independent components, but you might remember there are only 21 independent. In other words, the thing that links this six to that six is actually itself something that has additional symmetry, okay? Um, now, to see that uh, symmetry, um, it's, it's advantageous to put eventually um, everything into a vector notation, okay? And let me do this with black. And that notation is something we have seen before in undergraduate mechanics. After we do that, we're going to get a matrix. So this is going to go into a vector. That's going to go into a vector. Six by one, six by one, y, into in between six by six, 36. And it is symmetric, right? Subtract the diagonal, 30. From 36, subtract the six diagonal, 30 divided by two, upper lower triangular symmetric. So that would give you 15 independent on one side, plus the diagonal gives you precisely 21. Now, the fact that they're 21 independent doesn't mean that all of those 21 are really independent. This is, the, this is the maximum possible 21 independent components. So eventually, depending on the particular material we look at, actually the practical number, number in practice, could be much less. It could be as little as what? Two. It could be as little as two, okay? Um, so, so let me make a note here, and that's what, that's what we're discussing, so we're going to talk about this. So the number of uh, independent constants depend on material symmetry. So, now, what do we do? So there are six components, and we place them into a vector. Um, so, sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, and 1, 2, that would be the uh, usual way to go. Okay. So that is in terms of um, undergraduate notation or typical uh, linear elasticity notation. So that would be sigma x, that would be sigma y, sigma z, that would be tau yz. And then the order goes, so you take the last two, yz, zx, xy. And zx or xc doesn't matter. 
equals is symmetric, so then tau uh, x, y, right? Normal components and the um, shear components. So similarly, we would take the strain and put that also in um, vector notation. So epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3. And the notation that we are going to eventually follow is called the void notation. And in the context of the void notation, um, the convention is to put a two in front of the shear strains. Okay, so so we have two epsilon two three, two epsilon one three, two epsilon one two. And that is simply epsilon x, that is epsilon y, epsilon z. And the shear components are what we call gamma yz, gamma xz, and gamma xy. Um, so, now, there's a certain convention. The components of the stress go directly into a vector, whereas the components of the strain are slightly modified. Uh, the shear parts in particular are multiplied by two. Now, once you do that, so of course, every component here, so this is the form that we presently are interested in. Okay, that's what the theory says. So now, this is, in some sense for practical purposes, right? And now I will write that equals a matrix times this, right? The components of the matrix come from this relation. You know that sigma 1, 3 is equal to a combination of the strain components. Sigma 2, 3, combination of the strain components. It's implicit in here. And once you do tests to determine what these constants are, you know them, and so you can put them into the matrix, right? And as you do that, whenever you see, let's say, sigma 1, 1 is equal to something multiplying epsilon 1, 3, okay, you, in your convention, there is a 2, so the constant should take care of that extra factor of 2, right? If you have 5 times epsilon 1, 2, the constant that would go in there would be 2.5, because the factor of 2 is already in there, right? So you have to sort of do a simple map between the tensorial form in terms of components and this matrix form, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, once you pick this convention, the structure, the components of this matrix that relates strain to stress, or alternatively, stress to strain, is something you just carefully determine yourself, okay? So I have two matrices here, um, and um, clearly they are the inverses of each other. So if you, become, if you know the components of one, then you know the components of the other one, okay? And this one, it's perhaps at first sight more straightforward because here I have a relation between stress and strain. Here as well, I have a relation between stress and strain. So the components of this matrix, which is going to be six by six, should obviously be representable by the components of that. It's going to be in terms of com combinations of components of this tensor, okay? So in here, you will see at each entry combinations of, let's say, 
C1, 1, 1, 1, 1, plus something times, let's say, C2, 2, 2, 2, 2 et cetera, right? They go in here. So I'm going to give you one example, not this time, but next time, within the next special lecture, you will see one particular structure, okay? Um, but, so let's recall, this of course is something you have uh, seen before. Here, S is called the compliance tensor. Okay. Or the compliance matrix. And C, is the stiffness. Let's do it this way. Stiffness. And that's a six by one. That's a six by one. And what goes in between is of course six by six. And the fact that and the fact that um, I've already told you, the fact that it has 21 independent components is equivalent to saying that actually this matrix is symmetric because 30 by 6 by 6, if it's symmetric, it would have 21 independent components. So that's what it means. Now, we don't see immediately by looking at that form, right? Whether S or let's say C is symmetric or not, right? Uh, one could very carefully do some mechanical experiments, right? Give a certain amount of stress, there's a certain amount of strain or give a certain amount of strain, you get a certain amount of stress. You can do a combination of experiments and say that all oh, these experiments should, let me say, the results could, should coincide in this manner and in that fashion, let me say a mechanical fashion, mechanical in the sense that you prescribe strain or stress and you measure the other one, from those set of experiments, you could carefully argue perhaps that this thing, which in general has 36 independent components, should actually have only 21. In other words, it should be symmetric. But it's not very straightforward to see that. A better way to see that is to argue energetically, based on the energy that is stored uh, when you mechanically, right, uh, deform a material. And that's what I'm going to comment on shortly, right? And from the energetic point of view, the symmetry of these matrices will come out immediately. Um, okay, so that's where we are, where we are. So we have the general tensorial form, component notation, practical uh, formulation in terms of vectors. And now I have a matrix in there, compliance or stiffness one. Uh, it's sufficient to know one. I can get the other one by inverting the first one, right? Uh, and now the question is, what are the components are of those matrices, right? So, and how do I determine them? So before I do that, let me comment on um, two things. The first one, why do we have this two there, right? Now, and not there, right? So first of all, there's a certain relation. Okay, or a certain convention. I'm putting the epsilon like this, the stress like that. And as a result of that, strain there, stress there in that form, there is a matrix and that matrix now, based on that convention, will be expressed in terms of the components C, I, J, K, L. If I had picked a different convention for epsilon and sigma, then there would still be a matrix here but the components would obviously change because I have a different com convention for sigma and epsilon in terms of the original strain components. For instance, if I kick out this two, okay, then the components of this thing necessarily has to change, right? Necessarily. Namely, the less lower, uh, lower, let me say, block matrix here, lower right-hand side, three by three, would each component would, let's say, be multiplied by two. Okay, it's straightforward mod modification. Now, the question is therefore, is this the only possible convention? And the answer is no, okay? This is the void notation. This is the convention that you're used to and widely accepted, but there are other ones, okay? There is something called, for instance, the Mandel notation. And the Mandel notation, what it does is, instead of putting two twos there, it puts square root twos, okay? But here as well, 
also square root twos. Okay? And then, of course, now you have some vector and another vector. They're almost the same. Well, they are the same as these, but here you have square root two. So what goes in, ha in there will have slightly modified components in terms of CIJKL. Okay? Um, so if you choose a different notation, you will get a different matrix there. And the message is this is not the only notation, but that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to use because that's what we have done in undergraduate mechanics. Now, but it does make sense to introduce this two from a practical perspective. Uh, one, because gamma is something we know and understand. What was gamma in, how do we define it in undergraduate mechanics? Do you remember? The shear strain. Physically, what does it correspond to? So this is change in length per unit length. Okay, what is gamma? Angle change, right. It's the angle change. So that's something I can relate to. If I don't have the two in here, Epsilon 2, 3 by itself is not an angle change. You're missing a factor of 2, okay? So it's nice. That's one practical advantage. But there is another practical advantage. Eventually, uh, you would like to be ex express the strain energy, and that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, either in tensorial or in this vector notation. And conceptually, you would like to be able to write it in the same fashion without putting braces or tensorial signs uh, let me refer to the one-dimensional setting, and of course you will remember, so the strain energy that is stored per unit volume, and I'm going to remind you this once again very shortly, would be sigma times epsilon. Okay? Um, and so I can write this either in tensorial form, or I can write this as vectorial form. Okay? Whether I write this or like that, okay, I should get the same result. And the fact that I put a 2 there ensures that that happens. Okay? For instance, if I had not done so, okay, then it might not hold. Okay? So there are some practical details there that we are not going to further comment on. But this is, not, this is a notation that is obviously not arbitrarily chosen, and for that matter, any notation is not arbitrarily chosen. It should have certain uh, desirable features. Okay, so um, now let us talk about the structure, specific structure of those matrices, and I'm going to do that in the context of a series of increasingly complex material symmetry. So, and I'll start with the simplest case, which is isotropy. So for isotropy, um, the compliance matrix S has a very simple form that we have understood and used a lot in undergraduate mechanics. So first of all, you can divide that matrix into block matrices which have to do with normal, normal, normal shear, shear normal, and shear, shear coupling. Okay? Um, and for an isotropic material, it turns out that the off-diagonal block matrices are entirely zero. This one is diagonal. Okay. And the upper one, well, these two, of course, have to be symmetric because S is symmetric. And, uh, So I'm writing only the upper triangular part. Okay. That's the structure of the compliance matrix. And when you were a student, you probably did not memorize that per se, uh, but instead what you thought of was the uh, generalized um, Hooke's law, which would prompt you to think, right? S is, S multiplies the stress and gives you the strain. And so you would think, well, suppose I'm looking at the strain in the x direction, 
and that is going to be associated with the stress in the extraction. But not only that, I would have a Poisson effect, namely whether or not there is a stress in the extraction. If I have stress in other directions, they can also cause deformation in the extraction. So namely, I would have minus nu times the norm, the stress components in the other two directions, right? That's how we would think, okay? And this expression is associated with the first line here, okay? Um, so, and this one is associated with the expression, let's say, gamma xy is equal to um, one over mu, right, tau xy. That is a um, simple shear stress strain relation. Okay. okay, so you know what the constants are. Um, we have the um, Young's modulus that we have mentioned last time. It is greater than zero. And now we have another constant there, the Poisson ratio. And here we have the, now, a new constant, the shear modulus. Okay, the shear modulus is also greater than zero. Now, Probably, I know that you have done this for sure, but uh, as an undergraduate, you've done the exercise where you've shown that the shear modulus is actually not an independent constant, okay? It is actually in expressible in terms of the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, and this is the relation. So now, of course, it's easy to see that the Young's modulus has to be greater than zero. If there are no normal strains in other directions, if this is all I have, if I put a positive stress, I expect the elongation to be in that direction. So unless it's positive, that wouldn't happen. I would pull on something and it would contract. That's rather strange. Not that it cannot happen, but for a simple elastic behavior, it's not expected, should not happen. So, uh, so E has to be positive. And similarly, if I put a shear stress along one direction, I expect the deformation to be associated with that direction. And so mu also has to be positive in a purely elastic behavior. But what, what, what is Poisson ratio? Is it something always positive, negative? That's not entirely up, uh, like clear. So, and then, however, we, one can argue that it is something that has to lie between minus one and plus one half for isotropic materials. Okay, specifically for the case of isotropic materials. And I'm going to come back to that in a second and remind you why. Okay. Um, so that's one matrix, um, that is S. Now, of course, now if you would like to obtain the stiffness matrix C, okay, well, what you can do is once you know what this is, then you can simply invert that, right? But it's useful to write it explicitly and so in other words, if you like, one can do that analytically. Now off-diagonal terms are zero, so the off-diagonal terms of this one will likewise be zero. That's easy. And inversion associated with that part is also easy. I have only mu's here. Remaining components are zero. Uh, now the structure is going to be similar, and so here there are, to be, there are going to be two constants, and then diagonal components will be the same. Um, the convention dictates such a expression. Okay. Where now what you see here, the diagonal components in the normal, normal coupling part, two mu plus a new constant lambda, but this la lambda, right? So if I look here, I see two independent constants. E, if you like, and nu. Mu is not independent, okay? Um, or you can look here and you see mu and lambda, okay? Now, but suppose you do know what E and nu are. If you know what E and nu are, mu comes from that. And likewise, therefore, lambda should be able to, 
uh, we should be able to express lambda likewise in terms of e and nu. And indeed, that is the case. Lambda is equal to, let me write that with a different color. So that might be a constant that you have not seen before. Um, it is called Lame constant. And you should realize that because the Poisson ratio can be between minus one half and plus one half, this is always something that is greater than zero. This is always something greater than zero. But this here, can be negative, and therefore, Lame constant can actually be negative. Okay? But what's, what's important here is that I can express it in terms of the remaining constants. Okay. Right. Every constant is motivated by an expression of the stress in terms of the strain, or vice versa. Right? So these constants are naturally appearing because I want to relate strain in terms of stress. And this, there is a mechanical thinking behind that process. Okay, stress over Poisson, stress over Young's modulus, but additionally, the Poisson effect is incorporated. So those, the form naturally comes from this mechanical thinking, and this form comes from the need that you want to invert this and have a neat expression for the stress in terms of the strain. And hence, if you define this constant, you don't have to retain this mess in this matrix. Okay, that's the only reason. Right? Um, and similarly, there are other constants that are motivated by slightly different expressions. We are going to see at least one more, namely the bulk modulus. Every constant also has some, usually, physical interpretation as well, you, um, apparently. So now let me, let me um, write the stress in terms of the um, strain. So to show you that one more constant that I talked about. Um, so if I do that, I would have stress equals, now this is the expression that I'm going to take, all right? And um, if you do that multiplication carefully, and I leave that to you as a small exercise, right? So here, this one multiplies epsilon, the vector, right? Epsilon one, two, three, three and then two times epsilon one, two, three, two, two times epsilon one, two, and here you would have the, in the void notation the stress, okay? So now you have every stress component expressed in terms of every strain component, right? And now I'm putting that expression into tensorial form, okay? So your little exercise would yield that sigma is equal to lambda trace epsilon identity plus two mu epsilon. So that is the Foyt notation. This is the tensor notation. Um, now, what you can do is you can write epsilon or expand it in terms of its spherical and deviatoric parts. Any tensor can be expressed as 1 over 3 trace epsilon identity. That's the spherical part uh, plus epsilon deviatoric, and that's the traceless part, right? Okay, so now you see here lambda plus two mu over three multiplies trace epsilon in both cases. And what remains is the deviatoric part. And this is what one calls K, the uh, kappa, the bulk modulus. And that is something that is greater than zero. And uh, well, I'm always making a reference to undergraduate mechanics. You will remember the discussion behind why this has to be greater than zero. 
has to be greater than zero because trace of epsilon has to do with, or it's defined to be the volumetric strain. It's the change in unit volume. It's the change in volume per unit volume when you deform something, okay? And what you expect is if you have, if you take a material and put it under pure pressure, you try to compress it, you expect that it should decrease its volume in a purely elastic setting and not increase it. And that dictates that the bulk modulus should be greater than zero. So now that's nice. I know that physically this is something I can easily argue. I put that onto one side. And I also recall now, as I've said before, every material parameter that appears here should be expressible if you take Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio to be the fundamental two independent constants. Um, then, in the case of isotropy, the kappa is also expressible in terms of the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio. And the relation is that, okay? So we have one more relation. An alternative relation for stress versus strain, and it's this one, okay? So the need for kappa, well, it's twofold. One, it has a physical interpretation, but if you like to express it in terms of the deviatoric strain, then the need for kappa naturally appears. All right. Um, so now I've already told you that in isotropy, implicitly I've told you, and you remember from undergraduate mechanics again, that in isotropy there are only two independent constants. You pick your constants. The fact that they are independent means that means the following. So in general, C has 21 independent constants. And to determine those independent, 21 independent constants, what do we do? Experiment. You do experiments. You need to do experiments. This is theoretical results, but every material has its own constant. You do experiments on the material. So conceptually, you need to do an experiment that provides you with 21 independent equations from which you can determine those constants, okay? Sufficient equations for sufficient for the number of uh, unknowns you have. So, uh, so, so those tests, conceptually, are limited to only two in the case of isotropy, okay? Um, so, well, what does it mean that it is um, isotropic? Um, it means the following, let me remind you mechanically. This is the highest level of right, symmetry um, because two is the lowest number you can have. Okay? There isn't a material that has a single independent constant. Okay? Two is the lowest. Okay? And then I'm going to discuss a few more with increasing numbers of independent constants. So with respect to that, I'm referring to um, isotropy being the highest level of symmetry. And practically, uh, this is something we discussed uh, probably as a in an undergraduate course again um, in a two-dimensional example. Okay, so suppose I take a in two D a disc or in three D a sphere, and on this disc I put a marker that tells me the orientation of that disc. So this is a certain sample from a plate of material, right? And um, I'm going to take different orientations, actually, of the disk. So that is one. Let me take a slightly misoriented one. And let me take a entirely rotated one through pi over 2. And of course, you, the rotation can be arbitrary. Any rotation through between 0 and 2 pi, that's admissible. And the exercise is you take a certain amount of load and you pull on that disk through the two sides. So that's your load. And you apply that load, let's say, right, between those two points. And then you also monitor the change in the distance between those two points. And you call that delta. Okay, so the load is always the same, but the displacement between the, the, the elongation is possibly slightly different. 
So let me call this case one delta one. The elongation here is delta two. The elongation there is delta three. So the isotropy means that no matter how much you rotate this disk, the orientation you measure is always the same. Right? So isotropy is in some sense, therefore, orientation independence. And that's actually, I'll highlight this word orientation slightly because that's what precisely symmetry implies. It implies something about the orientation dependence of the material. Isotropy has none. It has no preferential orientation. Okay. And in 3D, you could take a sphere and do the same exercise by arbitrary rotations. In 3D, again, you should always measure the same displacement through the same uh, for the same load. And that's how you would characterize, um, characterize actually isotropy, right? So there's a trick here. If I give you a material and that's a black box for you, you don't know what the material is. You could first try to see whether it's symmetric, or whether it's isotropic by doing such tests, but that would probably be cumbersome. Perhaps what you would like to do is instead directly go for a set of tests that would deliver you the whole 21 components of the stiffness matrix. And then you would have a look at the structure of those matrix. You would look at the numbers, okay? You would see certain numbers, and if those numbers behave this pattern, then it must be isotropic. That's how it, but it may not. In that case, it's not isotropic. Well, what could it be? So that takes us to the next level. So the next level is cubic symmetry. Now, some examples to, by the way, isotropy, um, right? What can you think of an isotropic material? Could be, give me an example. Okay, so not all are amorphous, but yes, you could have a polymer, let's say rubber, okay? You could take glass, perhaps, uh, and, and, uh, and even metals. So at microscopically, you know that the metals are composed of crystals. Every crystal is a certain structure that is probably not going to be isotropic, uh, but they occur in a polycrystalline structure, and then as an aggregate, microscopically, they display isotropy, okay? Um, now, that brings us to actually nicely to cubic symmetry because um, single crystal metals have can have different crystal structures, of course, but um, I'm going to list three ones that are associated with so-called uh, cubic symmetry. So in each case, the repeating structure of the crystal structure, the fundamental unit cell is a cube. Okay, hence the name cubic. Okay. And in every case, there are atoms which sit at the corners. There's an, another one there. Okay. Now, if there is no additional atom appearing in your unit cell structure, it's called simple cubic. Um, and this appears to be a very rare one. One example that I have extracted is polonium. Okay, but it does happen. Okay, that, that, that's the message here. Not that I have some special interest in polonium. It's just it exists. Okay. Um, now, if you have a single atom sitting right at the center of the cube, then it's a body-centered, right? You have an atom that is at the center of the body, right? So this is a body-centered cubic structure. Well, let me just write BCC, body-centered cubic. And examples are actually common. I'll write two that 
you hear and heard, have heard often, iron and tungsten. Okay. And if you have atoms that sit on the faces, there is another one there, there. That would be a face-centered cubic. And examples here are, for instance, um, aluminum. That's a famous example. And silver, etc. This one's also easy to see, um, easy to find examples. Sorry. So these are three examples for the case where the material displays cubic symmetry. In other words, you would go ahead, perhaps you don't know that um, this is a cubic material, so you do your 21 tests or whatever, and you extract the structure of C, and you see that C, the stiffness matrix, displays a certain symmetry or the compliance, whichever one you're measuring, right? And you look at the, uh, right, the structure that it displays. It turns out that the structure of a cubic material is exactly the same as the structure of a isotropic material, okay? So S has the same, that's what I mean by this sign. It has the same structure as isotropy, but there is a catch. And the catch is, and I'm going to pull this down for a second, right? You have plenty of constants here that you've determined experimentally. Your experiments reveal that everything is zero there, everything is zero there, everything is zero. You determine three uh, values that are equal here, etc. That's what I mean by the structure. Three values here are equal. So from this set of numbers, you can extract the value of E and nu, right? Okay, you, you've done your experiments. You have sufficient numbers here. You can find E and nu. E is easy, and from here you can immediately find nu from that number. But then you go ahead and you also find this number, whatever number you have here, invert that, that's mu. You check whether this holds, and it turns out it doesn't. Okay, so the numbers fit this pattern, but this, the numbers you've determined for mu, e, and nu, do not satisfy this. That is the case of cubic symmetry. The structure of S or C displays the same pattern as isotropy, but mu is not equal to e over 2, 1 plus nu. Okay, and hence you have 1, 2, 3 independent constants. So two is isotropy, um, three is um, cubic symmetry, and then we're going to do, go to the next one, which is nine, okay? Um, actually, there's one other in between, uh, five, but I'm going to come back to that later because the next one is something you've seen in undergraduate mechanics. Before I do that, I just remembered I forgot something, and I'll so pull up this board and once again and move a little bit here. Um, so let's just recall that, that, that's something we discussed in undergraduate mechanics, but let's just recall this restriction, right? So why does nu have to be between minus one and plus one half? Well, suppose nu is at a value of zero, which means you pull on a material and it doesn't contract or expand, right? Uh, so it's insensitive in the other direction to a deformation in one direction, right? Something like, let's say, cork is almost like that. Um, so. So it's zero, and suppose now I try to decrease a little bit. You can decrease it towards minus one. If you hit minus one, this will be infinite, which means that the slightest deformation will cause or require infinite stress, right? Because mu times gamma is equal to tau, right? And that doesn't make sense, and hence you say, well, nu cannot be equal to minus one, in fact, okay? Um, so if it's minus one, it means no matter how much you stress you apply, you apply a finite amount physically, you cannot deform the material, okay? It's 
infinitely rigid with respect to shear deformation. So it can be really minus one. This constant is then meaningless, but physically it means no matter how much shear stress you put, it doesn't deform, okay? So that's the lower bound. Now we move over here, and we were at a value of nu equals zero, and now you keep increasing towards one half. And if you hit one half, this becomes infinite. So that's your upper bound, which means that you have a material, you try to compress it, and if kappa is going to infinity, it means no matter how much pressure you apply, you cannot change its volume, okay? So I cannot recall a material that has nu equals minus one, precisely, it can get very, very close to it perhaps, but uh, this one in practice is easily satisfied by materials such as most polymers, okay? So they are almost incompressible. In practice, not perfectly, but nu can be, let's say, 0.4995, whatever, okay? Um, all right, so having mentioned that, and having mentioned cubic materials, okay, let us go to the next level, which is orthotropy. Okay. Again, I throw in a remark. In all of these structures, right, so for instance, if you were interested in for an isotropic material, what is C111? What is C1122? I haven't told you those, okay? So you don't know the components of the fourth order tensor. You know the components of the matrices that link stress to strain in the Foyt notation, right? So, uh, so next time I'm going to give you one example where you see that relation at least once, okay? So let's go to orthotropy. So in orthotropy, it turns out there are nine independent constants. And the way to get orthotropy in uh, 2D or 3D, it's easy. In 2D, in composite mechanics, you, materials, you typically have plies. Each ply is made up of some compliant material um, that forms the matrix, let's say something like epoxy, some polymeric material. It's easily, you can easily shape it it's resistant to, let's say, um, um, fracture, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a weak material, so what you'd like to do is you'd like to reinforce it with a fiber, and that could be a glass or Kevlar or maybe even a metal type fiber. So glass carbon or let's say Kevlar, three different types of materials. So that's your stiff fiber. And that gives you the strengthening. And you can do this in uh, 3D as well. And I'm going to pick, first of all, right, I'm, I'm picking the material I'm going to represent as a cube and that conveniently gives me some axes. This, let's say, to be, take it to be x. I put some fibers in the x direction, like that, okay? And then I define a y direction and I put some fibers in the y direction. Okay, let's say this is glass, this is Kevlar, and then I'm going to put carbon as well. Okay, stick them in that direction along the y direction. And then I could look into the z direction and throw in fibers in that direction, stick them along the z direction. Right? So that would be a nice orthotropic material in 3D. I'm assuming I'm putting different fibers in each direction so that we see the full anisotropy appearing. If you put a smaller number of fibers, then the number of independent constants, or same type of, of fibers, the number of independent constants could be different, will be different. So, So assuming that is the case, now we would obtain a structure that, again, there is always 
block matrices that represent interaction between normal and shear components of stress and strain. Normal, normal, shear, shear, etc. Um, so you do your experiments on that block of material, and your experiments, experiments reveal this pattern, right? Now, what you have to realize is anisotropic materials, meaning anything that's not isotropic, has a preferential direction. Okay? Only isotropy has no preferential direction. You can rotate in any way you like. And you can do an experiment. The constants you determine will always be the same because there is no direction preference. Anisotropy, by definition, has a per direction preference. And hence, when I do my experiments, and I'm indicating this to be x, y, and z, and I get a matrix, okay? This is only for the case when my axes aligned with these material fiber directions, let's say. If I had picked some strangely oriented axis direction, and I did my test, let's say I pull in the x direction, measure the strain in that x direction, but that x direction doesn't align with any of these fiber directions, then the structure of this matrix will change. Off diagonal components will not be zero, et cetera, right? So it's important to realize that when you have an isotropy, your axis with respect to which you are writing this matrix is important, okay? This one is for such an orientation, okay? So it's one over EX, one over EY, one over EZ, one over mu, YZ, one over mu, CX, XY. Okay, and then let me write the off diagonal ones with a different color to make it less messy looking. So minus new yx over e y. Okay, um, so how many independent constants do we have? Nine, why? Well, you start counting, you see first of all shear and Young's moduli, one, two, three, right? Four, five, six, and these I already know, the E's, I mean, seven, eight, nine, right? Well, what does new yx mean? It's associated with the length change along y when you impose something along x or vice versa. And this is the other way around, right? So now, is new xy equal to new yx? No, because what we have to have is symmetry in this. This has to be equal to that, and ey is not necessarily e equal to ex, and therefore, the Poisson effect in complementary directions, in two directions you pick, it's not the same, that's what it means. You pull along x, you have a certain, let's say, contraction along y, okay? Then you pull along y, you have a certain contraction along x, they are not the same. That's what it means for the Poisson ratio not to be equal. Okay, but if you know this one, and if you know the Young's moduli, then you can find the other one due to symmetry. So overall, you have nine independent constants, okay? Um, and I've put in the remark regarding the special choice of the axes um, there. Um, 
So what if I put exactly the same set of fibers, the same fiber type, along each direction by the same volume fraction and in exactly the same way? Suppose I have an excellent control over my production. Okay? What does this fall down to in terms of symmetry? Probably cubic, right? It's so you expect because fibers are the same, you do shear experiments in every direction, it's the same. Young's modulus are the same, Poisson ratios are the same. So, oh wow, is it isotropic? Probably not, because you put in those fibers. The matrix itself is most likely isotropic. Uh, but because you have fibers, now the shear effect is probably different from the um, uh, from the combination of Young's and Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. So it's most likely going to be cubic. So, so, so it's not only the structure that matters, it's also the ingredients that you have that determine the symmetry. If I do the test, then it might look like cubic, but it has that structure, except that the fibers are the same, right? Um, and perhaps even for simple choice, like some special choice of the fiber uh, value, it might even be uh, isotropic, right? In the trivial case that it's epoxy fibers that would be meaningless, but it would be isotropic. So what I'm trying to say is uh, the structure, along with the ingredients, uh, determine what the symmetry of the matrix is. So, okay, so we've seen two, we've seen three, we've seen nine, and in some sense they are related to each other. Now, and I've discussed these quantitatively. Uh, I will discuss one more qualitatively, um, and that is transverse isotropy. So transverse isotropy is, I'm going to write here something like uh, cubic less than orthotropy in the sense that this has nine independent constants, this has three, and let's write isotropy as well, it has two, and this one has um, five. Okay, so the naming implies that there's some sort of isotropy and there is a direction associated with it, and some dress transverse direction. So let's, let's discuss what that means. And I'm going to draw you here a caricature of some, uh, let me say, um, I don't know, some part from your body. Okay, and suppose I have, uh, I, don't, I have no idea whether this is the actual structure, but I just made up. Suppose there's some piece of muscle there that is going to like, right, help you move your bones with respect to one another by contracting and relaxing. So that's your muscle. Now, when you look at the structure of the muscle in an idealized, right, you can imagine this. If, if you do eat meat, you can imagine the structure of the muscle. You can imagine the fibers running down along its length. Um, so, so that helps, right, reinforce this thing along one direction of load carrying versus the other direction. So if I idealize this as being a cylinder, Okay. And there are fibers that run along its length. Okay. And so that there's a preferred direction I see that and I expect that it will not be isotropic. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have or look at this thing from the top. Okay. And then so we have these muscle filaments. Um and I'm going to draw the top view over here, okay? And the, the, the structure of these filaments is, doesn't have some perfect structure. It's what I'm going to call random, okay? There is probably some physiolo physiological range of, let me say, volume fraction, size of the fibers, et cetera, and, but, 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 if you take any two samples, the, the, the cross-section is going to be highly different across the samples. And so there's some random 
in-plane uh, fiber distribution. Okay. Now the fibers have themselves, let's say they do have some finite right, diameter. Okay. Um, so what you could do is, right, so it's like almost in a two-dimensional world, you have fibers or particles, right, disks thrown into a matrix, okay? Um, the reality, physiological reality is, is not like that, but, but let's imagine it to be that way. So you have some matrix and within, it, within those you have some particles. Now, however, these particles do not have some nice pattern, like they are not organized along squares or something. They're entirely randomly distributed. Hence, it turns out you, you take this thing and you do your test in 2D, you pull in that direction, you rotate by a certain amount, do the test, you, t you, you find out that the values you measure, displacements you measure for given fixed values of force are almost the same. So in other words, within this plane of fiber distribution, in that direction, let's say, in the transverse direction, you have isotropy, okay? Transverse to the fiber orientation, right? So this is your in-plane isotropy. Okay. Now, however, the amount of extension you get for a given value of force along that direction is going to be probably much more than the amount of extension you get for the same force along that direction because the filaments act very effectively along that way to restrict or strengthen the material, whereas here they don't have as much, uh, as much effect because the fibers are not connected to one another. In between there's a weaker material that can easily deform, right? So the stiffness along that direction is not going to be the same as the stiffness along that direction. Hence, it's not going to be isotropic. But there is some symmetry, unlike that case, or some randomness, some isotropy. So that reduces the number of unknowns, but it turns out not all the way to three, but something in between to five. Okay, then that's transverse isotropy. Okay. So this is actually, um, as much as I will discuss uh, in this special topic, now, of course, material symmetry and its incorporation into relation between stress and strain, elastic or inelastic, okay, goes beyond the small deformation and hence, as I said, beyond the elastic regime. So in particular, at, let's say, finite deformation, elasticity, nonlinear elasticity that we're going to start talking about next time should also be formulated not only for isotropic materials, but also for anisotropic materials. We will not go ahead and discuss that also there. You will have a chance at least in a problem to sort of um, uh, discuss um, anisotropy formulation at finite deformations, but we won't be able to do it in the, in the, in the course. Okay. Um, so yeah, so next time our focus will be relating stress to strain but at large deformations for materials which are, I'm going to say soft. Soft in the sense that you give a certain amount of load and with respect to, let's say, metals or uh, let's say glass, etc., they can easily deform at smaller stresses, okay? So for such materials, because deformations are rarely small and they do have to be small for the small deformation setting to apply, linear elastics to apply, because deformations are so large, this theory is limited, okay, um, and hence we have to go beyond it, and that's what we are going to 